Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so we're here in um, John chapter one. Everyone have an outline? Um, kids have an outline? Y'all have an outline? All right. Uh, we are picking up where we left off, and hopefully today we're going to close out the prologue. The prologue of the Gospel of John is the first 18 verses, and we are, uh, we are, Lord willing, seeking to close that out today. Um, John 1.18, um, the Word of God in John 1.18 reads the following, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And we talked about the first part. No man has seen God at any time. And the point in your outline, point number one, we dealt with the invisibility of God. No man has seen God ever. No man, and this no man or woman, and this is a universal statement. This is an absolute claim. No one absolutely has seen God's face unmediated, nor the fullness of his presence unveiled completely and totally, nor his form, as Jesus would call it in John chapter 5. And we talked about this last week. Even the Old Testament saints who claim to have seen God, they saw, for the most part, and I want to say com completely and totally, they saw the pre-incarnate Son of God. They saw the Lord Jesus Christ before he came and assumed the human nature. Because Jesus Christ is said in the book of Colossians to be the image of, of the invisible God. There's a couple of things that we learned last week that are takeaways so that we move forward into and press forward into our study and point number two in our outline. One of the things that we want to, um, you know, settle down with and, and understand is that we are personally unqualified to see God. Unmediated to see God's face completely and totally. This is what Moses said. Moses said this in Exodus 33, verse 20. Because, you know, and he's writing this, he's recording God's word after he had uh, asked to see the Lord's glory. The Lord said, I'll, I'll show you my glory. But then he says in verse 20, you cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and live. We're not qualified to see God face to face in his unmediated glory. We will not be able to live. Not only that, but according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 6, 16, he teaches us that we are unsuitable. We're unsuitable, but first unqualified, then unsuitable. We're unqualified because by nature, we're not eternal, we're temporal. We're by nature sinful and not pure or righteous. You know what Matthew chapter five says? It says that uh, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what? They shall see God. By nature, our hearts are not pure, perfectly pure. We are unqualified and unsuitable. This means that we do not have the capacity, the ability, um, the equipment to actually see him because of where he dwells, where he dwells. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, it says, who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor 
and power everlasting, amen. We cannot see him. We have not seen him. And we cannot by nature approach him that dwells in unapproachable light. We can't approach him. We're unqualified and we're unsuitable. It's important for us to capture those two terms. The reason why is because if God is invisible and we're unqualified and unsuitable to actually see him, then we by nature are without hope. We're without hope. Because to not see God in his fullness is to be separated from him. It is to be separated from him. It is to be without fellowship with him. For example, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Thessalonians. He says, um, when he's talking about the um, judgment of God, when Jesus Christ returns, there are going to be people that are going to be separated from the glory of his presence forever. They're going to be banished into outer darkness. They're going to be banished into this place called hell because they are sinful. We are sinful by nature. And here in John 1.18, the, the purpose of uh, the Apostle John in, in, in recording verse 18 is this. Just as he has testified that he has seen his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father who is full of grace and truth and who has unparalleled glory. He is the only one, in verse 18, that is qualified and who is suitable and capable of not only seeing God, but making him fully known. Christ Jesus, unparalleled glory and fullness, reveals that he alone has seen the Father face to face, and he is the only one qualified and capable to behold him and reveal him. And again, this is why we have point number two in your outline. Look at here in point number two, the intimacy of the Godhead. We're looking at the closeness of the Father and the Son eternally. Now here in the second part of John 1.18, where after it says, no man has seen God at any time. Then what we have is the only begotten son. You see that? The only begotten son. Here it is mentioned again, but in your best manuscripts, in the original language, it literally records this, the only begotten God. The only begotten God. Now, this is important, and this it's, it's, you know, for, for those who try to make sense of this phraseology, the best translation they can render was the only begotten son, because it is in reference to his sonship. When we talk about the begottenness of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're talking about him being the unique God. The word here for begotten is the word mono. Guinness, which is just one, and then we would say here, of a kind. He is one of a kind, the only one of his kind, the only begotten son who is God of the Father, equal with the Father, but has not been created, has no beginning or an end, who is called the Son of God. He is the only begotten Son. The term monos is one or the term alone. Alone. We talked about this already. And here he is viewed to be the one and only, and we will get into this, um, get into this, as it says here, if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter one, let's go to Hebrews chapter one.
1, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, have in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He is the brightness of his glory, the express image of God's person. This is who Jesus is. He is the only begotten God, one who is equal with the Father, one who doesn't have a beginning. Or, and then it says, but the only begotten God, the only begotten Son. And then it says here, which is in the bosom of the Father. You see that? Which is in the bosom of the Father. So, again, the anthropomorphisms, the term bosom for the term body, is, is, is used right here in description of um, the Father. Really, it conveys something about the relationship. It conveys something about the closeness, the intimacy, the fellowship between the son and the father. And point number two, this is how I framed it. The union between God the father and God the son, he is in his bosom. And so just, just think about this here. When we talk about the term bosom it conveys something significant so like it's the front of the body between the arms right here in front of the body between the arms it's of the one who so reclines at the table that his head covers the bosom as it were the chest of the one next to him. It's a closeness. It's an intimacy. And it has to do with being a partaker of. It has to do with being in union with. This has to do with intimate fellowship with. So if you go to Luke chapter 16, for example, let's go to Luke 16, and I'll show you in Luke 16, where Jesus is giving a parable in Luke 16, and he is describing what Lazarus, this poor man Lazarus, shares with, with Abraham. So the closeness, the being a partaker of, being in union with, being in intimate fellowship with, in Luke 16, look at verse 22. In verse 22, Jesus says, our master says this, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's what? Into his bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his what? His bosom. Okay, so, so really what we're to learn here is that, is that Lazarus, is connected to Abraham in a very intimate way. Abraham is a covenant head, if you will. He, you know, God made a covenant with him and we call it the Abrahamic covenant. There are promises that were given and the, the essence of the promise is everlasting life. He made a promise to him and his seed after him. And that seed ultimately being who? Christ. Right, And by way of application, everyone that believes like our father Abraham. So Lazarus, he, this poor man that died, he had fellowship with Abraham and was a partaker of the same blessing as Abraham, 
because he believed the gospel. He truly believed the gospel. And you see, he was carried to Abraham's bosom. It shows the union that Abraham and all of his seed have when it comes to dying and actually entering into this afterlife called eternal life, where, where they get to share in the joy and in the, in the riches of the blessings of the covenant that God Almighty made with Abraham. And you see the closeness, you see the intimacy, you see, you see how he is comforted. This is what Abraham explains to the rich man. He is partaking in the comfort that God promised. His comfort, the rich man's comfort was on this earth. Now he's tormented and he's suffering the wrath of God. He is not a partaker with Abraham in the blessing. He is excluded, right? So you see the idea of the term bosom being used is to convey closeness. It's to convey um, being a partaker of. It shows intimate fellowship. But also turn with me to John chapter 13 because you know, in the prologue of John, everything is set up so that by the time you see this phraseology used again, you're able to learn a little bit more and, 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 and see how John develops what he means by the term bosom. Here it is used literally, but you see um, in principle the uh, benefits and, um, you know, the, the blessing of closeness. And here in John chapter 13, verse 23. And by the way, as we're doing this, don't you want to be close to God? Don't you want to be close to Christ? Doesn't it make sense that if Jesus is whatever it means for him to be in the bosom of the Father, and he has the ultimate closeness and intimacy, that he's the only one that can bring you into that intimacy and bring you into that closeness. This is where we're going. This is why John is making the argument that he's making. But here in John 13, uh, in verse 23, let's start there. Verse 23. No, verse 21. When Jesus had thus said he was, uh, when, when Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked on another, on one another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, one of his disciples, right? Whom Jesus loved. Now this phraseology, whom Jesus loved is a um, true and humble statement of John talking about himself. He never mentions his name in the gospel of John, but he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved, right? His name to him doesn't matter. All that matters is that Jesus loves him. Isn't that right? What about you? What, what, what matter is your, your reputation or the fact that Jesus actually loves you? that Jesus loves you. Well, well, that's all that matters. Our reputation doesn't matter. We're good. We, sh we should be satisfied with that. That's how John, this is how he is giving his testimony because he is making it very clear that it is not about him, especially when it comes to exalting Christ and manifesting forth his fullness. But in verse 24, Simon Peter, therefore, so we have John is reclining in Jesus' bosom. We already talked about this, right? They're at the table. He's leaning on the chest of Jesus, very close to the Lord. And, and in verse 24, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it, who it should be of whom he spake. So Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. Everyone's wondering who it is, if it's them, but nobody really knows. It's a mystery. But now the one that is closest to Christ in proximity and laying on his bosom, he's about to get the, revela uh, the, the revelation. And Peter is like, hey, ask him, who is it, right? Ask him. They're all at the same table, right? <laughs> ask him. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, 
Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, thou, uh, that thou doest do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. <laughs> for some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, by those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the saw, this is John recording his testimony of what he knows because he reclined at the bosom of Christ. He then that had the saw went immediately out and it was what? It was night. All right, so, so he's very careful. Well, what, what do we have here? What, what, what do we see here? In John 13, here, when we look at John, the one whom Jesus loves, leaning on his bosom and be, be, being privileged to learn something, it demonstrates, this is what it demonstrates when it comes to being in the bosom or leaning on the, the, the chest um, in between the arms um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It demonstrates the privilege of what closeness and fellowship gets you. Okay, which is insight and revelation into the word of God through Jesus Christ, who is the word of God. And, and here's, here's the thing. It, it was already prophesied in, in Psalm 41, verse 9. My friend whom I ate bread with has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus Right before he dies and right before he's betrayed, he, he utters that prophecy and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And John was privileged to get the revelation of who it actually was that would actually betray him. That's, what, that's the benefit of this being in the bosom. Being in the bosom. You are a partaker of information, intimate information, secrets. Knowledge. knowledge a depth that not is shared it's not shared with everyone else so as we're as we're contemplating uh john uh 118 and we hear jesus being in the bosom of the father he is in close unbroken proximity to the father where he actually gets to see the father in all of his fullness all right um, now, now here's here's what it here here's what we can we, we we can gather from this as we continue to move forward. The idea has to do with the eternal closeness, the eternal closeness of the Son to the Father. It has to do with a covenantal intimacy. Was with God. And the Greek construction says face to face with God. There was a glory that the word had with the father before the world was that he shared with the father. Okay. So, so it, it corresponds with that. And it is clarified in um, John 17 in his high priestly prayer. And he talks about the glory he had before the world was. And he talks about the love that the father had for him. It's an eternal and everlasting love. And the love that he has, that God has for him, he has for his people as well. But here's something else that, um, that, that you, should, you should know as we contemplate the cross. Anytime the word of God is read and taught and expounded, the gospel must be um, lifted out, brought to bear, and, and made clear because that is where we're not only saved, but sanctified. Do you know that when we talk about the closeness of the Lord Jesus Christ to the Father, being in his bosom, do you know that it is actually, um, this, this idea is, is, is seen in the reverse on the cross, in its horror, 
in its horror. It is seen in the horror of the cross where while Jesus is on the cross, hanging between heaven and hell under the wrath of God, bearing our sins in his body upon the tree, here's what he cries. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's only used to being close to the Father and having unbroken communion with the Father. He's used to the benefit of, of, of being beloved of the Father, the object of his favor and delight. I mean, at his baptism, he said, you are my son in whom I am well pleasing, yet the Father in whatever sense, in a mysterious way, he turned his face from the Son and in a sense, in a real felt sense, forsook the Son. It is seen on the, but here's the glory. Here's the glory. The son who had unbroken fellowship in union and communion with the father set aside his glory. I hope you get it. So that we can be who were separated from God, brought back into union with him in his death at Calvary's tree. And this is what he accomplished for sinners like us. And I'm so thankful because he, uh, he, he, he made it, not only possible, but accomplished our salvation in full, bringing us back to God. So in John 1.18, when it says, but the only begotten God, the only begotten son, who is in the bosom of the father, we should think about, you know what? This has to do with him being in the father and the father being in him. This is an unseparate, they're, 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 they're distinct but they can't be separated because of their eternal union and their eternal closeness and the benefit, therefore, that he actually has in being in this closeness with him is that he actually sees him for who he is and he can bring him out perfectly and fully and in a saving way so that we can actually know him too. So here, what we're talking about is sub point C in your outline in point number two is the unparalleled fullness of Jesus Christ. Moses didn't have this. None of the Old Testament greats had this. No, none of us have this before Christ, after Christ. He is the only one that has this fullness where he can actually behold the father in his face and the father behold his son. And, he, and, and when he sees his son, he sees himself, this mutual fellowship and unbroken union. Jesus actually claimed to see the father. He actually claimed it. Turn to John chapter six. And I want you to go there. This is that unbroken union. He is the one that claimed to see the father. Now, John chapter six, I'll start at verse 44 and I'll work my way to verse 46. In, in John chapter 6 verse 44 our lord uh says in verse 44 no man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and i will raise him up at the last day now here's something that's critically important that he says you see that little word can come to me okay so he's saying it is it is actually impossible it is actually impossible for anyone to come to the lord jesus christ by faith this is what he means by faith except the father which sent him effectually and irresistibly draw you to a saving knowledge of the son okay it is impossible that so so people that 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 start with them when it comes to their salvation they're ignorant or they're lying or or both actually um right when when they start with them saying that i actually searched out for god and i found him and that is why i am saved i put one foot in front of the other i believe the gospel i you know uh I have control of my salvation. That is a humanistic way of manifesting your blindness. Because by nature, we cannot come to him. This is what our Lord is saying. Otherwise, the, the only alternative, the only alternative, if, if, if we buy that, is Jesus in this verse is lying, right? 
And, and, and Jesus is not a liar. I mean, we learn, if we're, if we're aware of his fullness, he's full of what? Grace and what? Truth. That means there's no lies in him at all, right? And so here, no man, and you know, people go to this passage for the, the doctrine of irresistible grace. We use this passage to demonstrate that, you know, you cannot actually come on your own. You have to be risen from the dead and effectually drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is by um, the power of the Father. That is by the grace of Almighty um, through the gospel being being taught to you through the word of God being revealed to you. And, and this is precisely what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying here. Look at verse 45. It is written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. This here, he's quoting from the stipulations of the new covenant in, in Jeremiah chapter 31. They shall all be taught of God uh, from, from the greatest to the least. They shall all know me. Okay, this, this, is what, this is what he's referring to here. It is said in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the, the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. So Jesus makes a statement that it is impossible and no one has the ability in themselves to come to me except the Father draws him and he backs it up with absolute authority and that is the word of God. The word of God actually reveals they shall all be taught of God. Therefore, anyone that has heard and has learned of the Father comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, when it comes to our family members that are unsaved and our co-workers that are unsaved and our friends, um, our unsaved friends, um, we know that they can't in themselves come to the Lord Jesus Christ. They cannot. In fact, this, is a, this right here crushes the idea that you have a free will and that you could, of your own choice, come to God by the power of your own decision. Jesus says you don't have that ability. We don't have that ability, right? We have to be taught of God. He has to open up our ears. Faith comes by what? And hearing by what? The word of God. So you have to be taught of God. Therefore, anyone that has heard and learned of the Father comes, comes to the Son. Now look at verse 46. And this is what Jesus says here. Not that any man has seen the Father. So, so, so John was paying attention as he was listening to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and watching him do his miracles and he was beholding his glory and, and examining his fullness. He heard him say, not that anyone has seen God, at any time. Well, John affirms that. I, John is basically saying in verse 18, I got this from the master. He said himself, no one has seen God at any time. Not that any man has seen the father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the father. Who is he talking about? He's talking about himself. Jesus is talking here and he's talking about himself. He claims, he makes a claim that he has seen God. Now, what he does in the first statement is he actually clarifies what all the other Old Testament saints were, were meaning when they said they saw the Lord, like Isaiah, or when, 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 when uh, uh, Moses saw his glory, or when Manoah um, you know, saw God, or when Gideon saw God, um, God or, or, or anyone else that made that claim that they saw God, he's clarifying that. They didn't see him the way that he saw. They saw him through a glass dimly. <laughs> like we see through a glass dimly the glory of the Lord. And we see him through the revelation of Jesus Christ. But Jesus doesn't need Jesus he doesn't need a mediator to reveal the Father to him. He does not, he, he actually has unmediated fellowship with the Father. This is the point, unmediated. Christ has unmediated fellowship. This is his fullness that is not shared with anyone. This is, this is, this is what John is talking about. He's elevating him to the, to, to, to the highest. He's the alpha and the what? Omega, he is 
God, a very God, able to reveal the fullness of God alone. All right. So, so here we see this. No, not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. And therefore, here's something that I'll state in this uh, sub point D before we get into point number three, which I'm really excited about. Um, here, here is something that, that we should know, and I'm, I'm going to slow down in point number three so we can, we, can, we can work it through. If this is true, that um, Jesus is the only one that has seen the Father, then we must conclude that God is truly unknowable apart from Christ. He is truly unknowable. So think about all those in religion today. Think about all those who think that they have a relationship with God in Buddhism. Jehovah Witnesses. Mormons. Right? All your other religions that you can possibly, you know, Muslims. Nation of Islam. Think about Judaism. They wholesale rejected Christ. Do they know God? No, they do not. Now, this is um, offensive to most. For us that truly know God, because God has revealed Christ to us and has caused us to be brought into union experientially and gave us life and gave us grace to believe and to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, by, to bow to him and worship him and cling to him as our very identity. We're privileged. We're privileged people. And we're going to learn we're privileged because we're unqualified and unsuitable to know God. And yet we can say, because we know Christ, we know him. But here's what our Lord says. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by who? That is a bold statement. God is unknowable apart from Christ. And not only that, Knowing God apart from Christ is an unqualified and unauthorized way, and it doesn't get you the right information, and it doesn't get you the right relationship. They're not always lead to the same God. One way. That truth is personified in one person, and that life is, is possessed and given by one person, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so this is amazing. Look at point number three. And, and, and in John, John 1, 18, I'm still there. I'm still, I'm still, we're still musing and we're still thinking it through. We're still working it out. Um, this, is, this is what uh, point number three, the illumination of the God man. Um, the illumination of the God man. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to erase some of this here. The illumination of the God man. So John 1, 18, it says, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten son, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has declared him. The illumination of the God man, he reveals God exegetically. And we're going to talk about this. So this term, this term declared, you see that, that term declared in verse 18? It is this uh, term, oh yeah, let's spell that. It is the term ek sejet omai. Ek sejet omai. And that's where you get your English, your English word, our English word for exegesis it's a term exegesis and here the term ek ek is and i want you to capture this really carefully 
it is it, it, it means completely out of or from. I want you to get this. This intensifies this term completely. Sometimes in, in Greek terms, the, you know, when, when, it, when it has to do with coming out of something, it doesn't mean completely out, it just means out of. But this here, ek, it is completely out of or completely, uh, completely out from. And then when we look at this term uh, for hegeomai, uh, um, hege it means, and I'll just write it down. It means to lead to lead out or to bring out. It actually has to do with to lead out, to bring out, or to show my priority. So when we talk about this term, declare, it means to, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna um, write it here, to completely lead out, to completely lead out, or to thoroughly, you can write this down, to thoroughly explain or to fully bring out, or to fully show. And I love it. This is, this, this is an intense, this is an intensified term. This is what exegesis is, is to completely bring out, it's to completely lead out, to completely and fully show what is hidden. What is not apparent, it is to thoroughly explain, to fully manifest, to fully reveal. It is to explain or to narrate in a way that clarifies what is utmost, what is the priority of that thing that you're trying to grasp and comprehend? It's a very important. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. I'll show you where this term is used again in Luke 24. In Luke 24, and I'm going to read uh, a portion that way we can get a little bit of context, and then it's really going to be in verse 35. Start at verse 25. It says this in Luke chapter 24. It says, then he said unto them, and he's talking to, there's two, he's on the road of Emmaus, and these two uh, men do not recognize who it is that's with them on this road. He's asking them what's wrong, and they're telling him a story about Jesus, about himself pretty much, and how they thought he was the Messiah, and he died, and told them the whole thing, and and, and really, you know, we're talking in a way of, of unbelief. And verse 25, and, and really, they, they said, you know, we thought, we really thought that he was the one. Verse 25, he said, then he said unto them, O foolish, or, or O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is, ev it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went into uh, went in to tarry with them. Now I don't want to move past the part where Jesus actually expounded the scriptures, um, the Torah, you know, and 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 he expounded the uh, the Nevi'im, 
and, and the Ketavim, the, the whole Tanakh. He expounded all the Old Testament scriptures and he revealed himself. He was expounding and showing how he is the sum and sub, he is the sum and fullness of the content, the subject of the Old Testament. And, 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 and therefore, Psalm 40, you know, verse six and seven, uh, verse seven in particular, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. It is all about Christ. And he revealed that to them and he revealed his sufferings and his glories, but they constrained him they wanted him to stay with them. And usually when you're walking with the Lord and, and, and you're learning about Christ, don't you just want to stay right there when it's sweet to you? So you want to stay right there. So it's, it's, it's heaven. It literally is heaven. In verse 30, it says, and it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight <laughs> and they said unto one another did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures and they rose up the same hour and returned to jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying the lord is risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Verse 35, this is it here. And he told, and they told what things were done in the way and how he was, here it is, known. How he was known. Of them in the breaking of bread. That term known there is the same term that we're talking about here in John 1.18, that term for declare, that translation of declare, the same Greek term, exegetomai. It is the term for Jesus was completely manifested and he was completely made known to them in the breaking of bread, okay? He was manifested, he was brought out he was shown fully to them. They realized who he was when, they, when he broke bread. Remember, when you go back, their eyes were open when he, when he prayed and he broke bread and he, dis, he distributed to them. Their eyes were open. They were illuminated. Okay, They realized this is Jesus that we're, that we're beholding right now. And then he vanishes out of their sight. This is the term here. Go back to John chapter one. Um, here, what we have is um, when, when, when it says that, uh, when it says here that only begotten God in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has fully shown him. He has, he has fully um manifested him, led him out completely. Really what he's saying is he has made, he has fully made him known. He makes known the father completely. And this is in a saving way, in a saving way. It's only through Christ that he is made known completely and totally for our salvation. Now, this here is a, mo a mosaic fulfillment, so point A, of God being made known by the incarnate Christ. So turn with me to uh, Exodus chapter 34. I want you to see this here. Um, in Exodus chapter 34, if we pay close attention to what's happening in Exodus chapter 34, this is uh, a picture. This is, um, this is really an example of God being made known um, because in the Old Testament, we will say the Old Testament saints were saved the same way, were, were they not? They were saved. The, that, well, what that means is that Jesus had to make known the Father to them too. Like, the, like he's always been the only one that makes God known fully and in a saving way. Even with Moses. Look at verse five in Exodus 34. He's about to manifest forth his glory. Here in verse five, it says, and the Lord descended in the cloud 
and stood with him there. This is the pre-incarnate Christ in a cloud, standing with Moses, therefore is for Moses. And this is anthropomorphisms to, to really let you know that this Yahweh that came in the cloud that is standing is a second Yahweh that is now about to do something for Moses that will clarify for Moses what he's looking at. He is about to declare the name of the Lord. Just like it says in John 1, 18, the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Well, here in verse five, he stood there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaim the Lord, the Lord God, and he begins to list his attributes, merciful. And I'm glad that was the very first attribute he mentions. Amazing, because we, we need mercy. We need mercy. We need God to withhold some things that we actually deserve. We really do. And this is who he is. He is merciful. He is full of mercy, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So look, what did he behold? He beheld the glory of God in Christ and he had it explained to him what he was looking at. An exegetical sermon, exposition took place. The best preacher on the best subject was preaching the glory of God. It was God on God. This is, there's no higher subject here. God on God. And we're seeing and we're hearing about the fullness of God. He is full of mercy, he is full of grace, full of forgiveness, full of goodness, full of truth, full of, 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 of just, just, just goodness and also justice as well. He's full of justice. He will not let the, the guilty go unpunished. I'm so glad that he declared the fullness of God. He didn't leave anything that is in God unturned. And when you hear about this fullness that is in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only thing left to do is what all of the Old Testament saints did, is what, what even the apostle, uh, Paul, or the apostle John did, and it's also what John the Baptist did. You need to decrease now. Moses bowed himself to the dust and did what? He worshiped him. He humbled himself because he heard and he saw in part who God was. And it was because the Lord Jesus Christ made him known made him known and that was enough for Moses and it's enough for us you see the picture of the incarnate Christ his position standing with him and him proclaiming the name of the Lord also look at here sub point b in your outline God is manifested fully by Jesus Christ alone he is the witness turn to the Matthew chapter 11 I want you to see this here this is a passage a classic passage that we know and love and and uh we want to see this here in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, it's our Lord speaking here. It's our Lord speaking here. Look at verse 27. I want you to see this here in verse 27. I'll start at verse 25. Uh, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father. Lord of heaven and earth, because 
you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. And those who think they're wise, by their wisdom, they cannot know God. They cannot find him. God hides from them who he is. And to babes, those who, are, who, who God has made humble, because the kingdom is likened unto little children. It's to them that he has revealed himself to. And then our Lord says this in verse uh, 26, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. It, it is good for God to conceal and to reveal. It is very good for God to conceal and to reveal. And Jesus is thanking the Father for hiding and for revealing. For hiding and for revealing. For concealing and revealing who he is. And then in verse 27, he says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knows the Son but the Father. That's amazing. Y'all see that? No man knows the Son but the Father. <laughs> That's amazing. That, 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 should, that should let you know how, uh, that should let you know the closeness and the, the union between the Father and the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father? Yes. And then he says, neither know any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. He reveals the Father to whosoever he is pleased to reveal. Meaning you will not know him apart from Christ revealing who the Father is. And in order for the Father to, to be made known, Jesus Christ, the image of the invisible God needs to be made known. You see the collaboration between God the Father making Christ known. And when Christ is made known, the Father is made known. And that's by the Son sovereignly revealing whosoever he pleases, the Father, uh, who the Father is. And look at subpoint C. And let's go back to John 1 18. We're going to close it out right here. Um, here, he has declared him, he has made him fully known. This means that Jesus mediates fully a saving knowledge of the invisible God. Now, turn with me to John 17, and I want you to see this here in John 17. Now, because what is our, what is our subject for this series in the Gospel of John? What is, our, what, 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 what is the topic, the overall topic? Huh? Life. Life in Christ, right? Right. So, so it's important for us to know this acronym and to keep it in the forefront of our mind because, because again, we're, we're about to learn something about this in verse 18 of John chapter 1, and it's about to be clarified here in John 17. This life in Christ is defined as the life of God. Would you admit that Jesus alone gives eternal life? in an unending and a special knowledge knowing of who the father is right that that's true right so if this is true that this is what eternal life is and this is what jesus possessed and this is what he gives then we have to see 
eternal life, this life here, we have to see it as a as a special, that's I'm just gonna do this here. Eternal life. as a special, special gift. We have to see it as that. And we're about to learn something here, or at least be affirmed of something here in John 17, verse 2 through 6. Look at here at verse 2. Let's start at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is coming, or the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. It's a special gift. Because guess what? Everyone doesn't know God. Everyone doesn't know God, not because they failed to look for him, but because Jesus did not give them that life. He only gives life to all those that were given to him. Hence, election. Election. Before the foundation of the world, the Father gave him a people. Isn't that right? So many as you have given him. In verse 3, he defines what this eternal life is. And this is life eternal. That they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. All right. So what are some, what are some in, in, in here, when we, we're going to talk about what it means, what it means for uh, this eternal life to be a special gift. According to, um, according to John 17, 2, where he says that he has power over all flesh, authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to whosoever the Father has given him. Okay, is this special gift earned? No, right? See, it's unearned. It's unearned. Or we can call it unmerited. It is unmerited. Why? Because in verse 2, he gives this life not according to those who want that life or those who come to him, but he gives this life to whosoever the Father has given him, has chosen for this life, who has chosen for this intimate union and fellowship. It's unearned by us and it's unmerited. And therefore, it is not universal. Right? It is not universal. It is not universal. The revelation of this, this life, not, not everybody has, not, not everybody can earn it. Also, it is undeserved. So when we talk about like the, um, we usually call it the unmerited, demerited. We, 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 we call this the grace of God. It's by grace that you come to know who he is. When we define grace, we're saying that it's unmerited. It's not something that you can work for or earn. You didn't earn this. We can't earn this because, you know, we're sinful by nature. We're unqualified, as I talked about earlier. But also, it's undeserving. We actually did everything not to, not to deserve this gift. Um, so on both sides of the playing field, we are without hope unless God actually shows mercy to us. And this is what our Lord is revealing in his high priestly prayer. He is saying that, that those who 
experience everlasting life. It is a byproduct of the son sovereignly implanting that in your soul according to election, according to God entrusting to the Lord Jesus love gifts that he have chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world unto salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. So children, this is something that you can learn. Just because your parents say they know God, um, and just because your parents are worshipers of God, it doesn't mean automatically that where the parents are going, you're going. It doesn't mean, children, that you know God because your parents know God. This is important. This is why paying attention and actually asking questions, right? And, and, and really listening to mom and dad who are serious about the truth of the gospel um, is critical. And you being called to repent of your sins and you being called to believe the gospel, you being called to behold the glory of Christ and trust the father and turn away from your sins and live for him and not for yourself. That's something that God has to grace you to do. Because again, here's the simple truth. Jesus gives eternal life to only those the Father has given to him. And the way you know that you're given to the Father, you're one of God's elect, is if you believe the God, you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you turn away from your sins and you look to him as your only hope for glory, as your only identity. If you worship him, not because your parents worship him, but because he is glorious, because he is God, because he is worthy and you were made to worship him. And he, and, and, and not only that, more important, just, just, just the foundation because Jesus loved us and laid down his life for us and bore our sins in his body on the tree and died. And he satisfied the wrath of God because his sacrifice was perfect and his sacrifice was received of the father. And we know this because God raised him from the dead and he caused him to ascend on high and he was seated and is seated at the right hand of God sovereignly ruling the universe in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore jesus in christ he is filled he is full of joy he should be the he should be the believer's delight and all of our pleasures should be found in him and honestly, as sinners saved by grace, this is true, but not true at the same time. Right? It's true positionally, like we, we hear it, right? And sometimes we feel that way, but a lot of times, and sometimes we don't feel that way. And we have this, 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 this uh, gravitational pull called the flesh trying to get us to go find satisfaction in other things. So what mitigates that? What mitigates that? A revelation of Christ. And through Christ, a revelation of Father. How in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And I and we are complete in him. Complete in him. All right, so we're going to end it uh, in, in a moment. Look at verse, I'm going to show you this here. Look at verse uh, 26 of John 17. Uh, start at verse 24. This is lovely. Verse 24 of John 17. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you. But I have known you, and these have known that you have sent me. Verse 26. 
And I have declared unto them your name and will declare it, that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. How important is it for God to be revealed and declared and expounded and preached? It's so that the love of God may dwell in you richly and that Christ may dwell richly in your heart. Without Christ being expounded, without God being revealed and his word being handled carefully, you cannot love properly. You cannot see God fully. You cannot serve God diligently. This is what the benefit of knowing him and being known of him. In fact, this term declare here is not the same declare in John 1, 18. It is a different Greek word. And it means to make visible, make clear, make known. Sounds the same though, right? Sounds the same. So it's not just you preaching and, and it's sounding like a tingling cymbal and a sounding brass and saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's not just saying terms and saying just profound terms that you don't have the meaning to. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't mean any of that. It means being clear. It means bringing out what is there that is not plainly seen by the mind and by the eyes. That is a gift that God gives to the church so that we may have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost and that we may experience a communion with the indwelling of the spirit and the son dwelling with us, being with us, being in us. And this is the prayer that he made for all those that the father has given him. It's amazing that the love that the father has had for him may be in them. That the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Mm. And so we're, we're gonna close it right there. What I'll do is I'll pray and then we'll have a Q&A for any questions. Father, we thank you so much for uh, your word. And we thank you so much for the truth as it is in Christ. We thank you so much for revealing to us by your word that you cannot be known apart from your son. And we thank you for revealing your son to us so that you might be made known. Thank you for bringing us from a state of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your dear son. Thank you for um, saving us from our ignorance and illuminating our minds. Thank you for saving us from spiritual darkness and, and being spiritually dead and separated from the life of God to, to, to reconciling us to yourself through your son. Thank you so much for... Uh, for, for equipping the body of Christ with gifted men that um, are called to expound the word of God faithfully. And we thank you for our pastor, uh, Pastor Jesse. We thank you for the leadership at GBC and all of the men all around the world that you've called so that the love that you have for the son may be in us and that the son may be in us as well. The son desires to be in us. And that's why, that's the, that is the, 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 the nectar father of Bible study and, and worshiping you. That's the height, that's the climax of, of, of worshiping you by hearing your word and the spirit giving us an understanding. Thank you for an understanding. We ask that you would bless us in our Q&A and our fellowship and that you would grant us grace to have safe traveling mercies home and give us sweet sleep and strengthening sleep tonight. And if it be your will, wake us up in the morning with strength and vigor to do your will and help us to press more deeper into our Bibles um, and more deeper into prayer. 
um, and more deeper into our fellowship surrounding the word of God so that we might know you more. Because Lord, we don't know everything about you, but Jesus does and we're in him. And we're, we're as close to you as we're gonna be because we're in him. But it's gonna take an eternity to enjoy all of you. So help us, Lord, to be intent and habitual and to be diligent and to make it um, our, our life's journey as pilgrims to know you in Christ by your spirit. And we thank you so much for your goodness to us and for the forgiveness of sins that we have in our glorious Savior. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Are there um, questions, um, comments?